Hen and Shalom Grace and Peace This is part four of the video series entitled Roman Cross or Hebrew Tav. This series concerns some of the various aspects of the truth of whether our Messiah was hung on a Roman cross or was he specifically hung on a tree so as to fulfill the requirements of the law of the Most High given to us by Moshe or Moses. Now, we covered these details, including scripture references in previous parts of the study. However, scripture clearly says that our Messiah was hung on a tree and took upon himself the curses that were due us so that, in exchange, he would make us the righteousness of Elohim in Messiah. And so, what does that mean, the righteousness of Elohim in Messiah, or the righteousness of God in Christ? Because it is very important that the people of Yah be diligent, so as not to be derailed from that which is the fundamental truth of Scripture. Now, as a means by which to study this matter, we will consider the greeting, Grace and Peace, or in Hebrew, Hen and Shalom. We spoke briefly about this in Part 3 of the study. Now, with this brief study of the words grace and peace as a greeting, I want to make very clear that I am not saying that it is a matter of doctrine how we greet each other. I am not saying that it's a sin, but rather that something as simple as a greeting as it appears in Scripture can be evidence of more than what one might think of at face value. It can be significant of the revelation of a spiritual truth. Because I believe that it is critical that as we remove the robes of pagan Christian traditions such as Christmas and Easter and Roman crosses, etc., that we don't find ourselves now cloaked in the religious paganism of Judaism or slipping into Judaizing. And let us be clear, Pharisaic Judaism is built on the foundation of Talmudism and not Torah. Judaism, just like any other religious ism, elevates the traditions and culture of man above the word of the Most High. And that was one of the things about which Messiah rebuked the Pharisees. In this video, part four of our study, we will speak briefly on the words grace, which is sometimes translated as favor, and the word peace. Because when our Hebrew hearts of understanding are scripturally correct, we know that a greeting is more than a simple expression of the culture and tradition of a group of people. We know that words are containers of power, and especially so when those words are issued from the throne of grace of the Most High, Alihim Yahuwah, by means of the Prince of Peace, the Living Word, our Master, Yahusha, as he now speaks through the restoration of his kingdom within yielded vessels of clay. So, that means that the words we speak are opportunities for the power and authority of the Most High to be made manifest in spirit and in truth. In Scripture, we see that time after time, the emissaries or apostles used two words with which to greet the assembly. These 
two words are generally translated into English with the first word being either grace or favor and the second word being translated as peace. It is important that we consider the significance of the difference in the two phrases. On the one hand, shalom or peace, which is what we commonly hear expressed today. Or, on the other hand, grace and peace, or hen and shalom, which was what was expressed and recorded by the emissaries or apostles in the Renewed Covenant. Now, some may think that grace or favor is simply a Renewed Covenant or New Testament term. But, as we saw in Part 3, and as we will see further scriptural evidence of, it certainly is not. The grace or favor of the Most High is demonstrated throughout all of Scripture. However, as we will see, the grace or favor of the Most High makes a deeper impact on those who are the recipients of Yah's grace on this side of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Messiah. For example, Matthew 5, verses 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. End of quote. So, here we see Messiah speaking and making reference to the Torah, or law, specifically the commandment written in Exodus 20, verse 14, and Deuteronomy 5, verse 18, which says in both verses, You shall not commit adultery. But then, the living word of Yah, embodied in Messiah, goes on to give example of what the law fulfilled looks like. He says that the law fulfilled empowers one to obey, not simply the letter of the law, but rather the spirit of the law, by delivering one from even the desire to do wrong. And although this is an example concerning sexual lust, the lust of the flesh is the lust or coveting of man's flesh to do rebellion against the law of Yah. Matthew 5 verses 17 and 18 Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. End of quote. So, these were the words of the, the Messiah just ten verses before Matthew five twenty seven to 28. In Matthew five seventeen and 18, Messiah stated that he did not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill. So it is ten verses later in Matthew 5 verses 27 and 28, he explains what fulfilling the law looks like. It is certainly not a departure from the law, but rather it is an empowerment to obey the requirements of the law in a manner 
that is only available by the gift of the empowering grace of Yah, which restores the divine nature in those who have been redeemed. Fulfill. Um, it's Strong's number G4137. And it means essentially filled or well supplied with something. Level up a hollow. To furnish or to supply. What we're going to see is that the words recorded by the apostles or emissaries in the renewed covenant or New Testament are evidence of the understanding that it was only by the grace of Sovereign Yah that anyone is able to indeed receive shalom or peace, which essentially means wholeness and completion, which can only come by means of our Prince of Peace, our Sar Shalom, Messiah Yahusha, who some call Jesus. And so it is vitally important to acknowledge the component of grace when it comes to being able to reach peace. Just how important is grace? Well, Romans 3.24 says, Being justified freely by His grace or favor through the redemption that is in Messiah Yahusha. End of quote. And as we will see, grace or favor is an empowerment. In this verse, grace is the empowerment unto justification. It is the empowerment to receive the free gift of justification, which then empowers that gift to grow and produce the fruit of righteousness. Isaiah 53.11 He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. End of quote. It's Isaiah 53.11 and Isaiah 53.11 speaks of the righteous servant, our Messiah, providing justification as he was our sin bearer. Justify. Strong's number H6663. And it essentially means divinely pardoned by Messiah's full payment of the debt for sin, which liberates the believer from all divine condemnation. Iniquity, which is Strong's number H5771, and it's a Hebrew word that's taken from another word, which is h 5753. Now, H5771, iniquity, essentially means perversity, moral evil, fault, sin. And it's taken from a word, H5753, which means to make crooked or pervert. First Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life you inherited from your forefathers, but 
with the precious blood of Messiah, a lamb without blemish or spot. End of quote. Now, this then brings us to the dilemma caused by some of today's theologians. What does grace or favor mean? And what does peace mean? Well, generally speaking, churches have taught that grace means a cover-up. And peace means the absence of conflict. And of course, this misunderstanding of the true meaning of the word shalom, or peace, can foster the idea of unprincipled unity. Also, there are some who, although they do teach from a Hebraic perspective of Scripture, they teach keeping the law as a means by which one is saved, or a means by which one reaches peace, shalom. But is that what Scripture says? And beyond the whole matter of a greeting, what difference does having a correct understanding of grace and peace actually make to our understanding of the Most High's plan of redemption. Because let us consider the fact that Moses, the lawgiver, kept the law, and he was not allowed to enter the Promised Land. David, beloved King of Israel, was a lawkeeper. However, he pointed to his Lord, who was to come. And Messiah said of John, the immerser, a lawkeeper, Of all men born of a woman, no one was greater than John. However, he who is least in the kingdom is greater than John. Now, that's a powerfully important statement to understand. Genesis 3.15 And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. End of quote. Without grace, the promise made by the Most High in Genesis 3.15 cannot be fulfilled. Because mankind, in all of his attempts of it, at establishing his own righteousness, could not strike a death blow to the power and authority of the enemy of our souls. And without a proper understanding of grace, the fullness of our deliverance is blocked or obstructed. There are those who teach lawlessness, and there are those who teach legalism, and either knowingly or unknowingly they are two sides of the same coin. There are those who have left Christian churches because of the lawlessness that is erroneously being taught as grace, only to be snatched by those who teach the legalism of being saved by keeping the law, empowered by knowing who you are according to the flesh, rather than being empowered by the Ruach HaKodesh, or Holy Spirit, giving voice to the Torah, or law, written on our hearts, made possible only because of the once and for all cleansing blood covenant which has been sealed by the blood of the Lamb of Yah. Our Messiah was sent to us to accomplish something we could not do for ourselves. 
And what he did then empowered us to do what we cannot do on our own. That is, to produce the fruits of righteousness. Which brings me to a point. There are some who teach that the law has not been done away with. And rightfully so. They teach that we strayed away from keeping the law. And therefore, what is needed is to start keeping the law. However, we must be clear. No amount of keeping the law in our own power can establish right relationship with the Most High Yah. Galatians 2.21 I do not nullify the grace of Elohim. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Messiah died needlessly. Now, this verse lets us know that it is not enough to simply keep the law. There was purpose in Messiah not only dying for us, but as well resurrecting for us, so that by the subsequent outpouring of the same power that resurrected Messiah, we would bear the fruit of righteousness. The outpouring of the empowering Ruach HaKodesh, or Holy Spirit, which is the living word of the Most High, is indeed a down payment on our eternal inheritance, which even now completes us and gives to us the enablement both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Which means that in times past, before coming into right relationship with Elohim, by receiving the grace made available to us from the Most High through our Messiah, there were most certainly places in our lives where we would have known to do right, but lacked the desire and the power to do what we knew to be right. Romans 7 speaks of this condition of fallen man that is the condition of all mankind in the flesh. Paul laments, When I want to do right, sin is an intricate part of my flesh or human nature. The world promotes that man is basically good, and generally the lack of self-esteem is a problem facing most people. However, that's not the assessment that Scripture makes. Scripture says that all of our righteousness is as of filthy rags, which is a picture of a woman going through her menstrual cycle, being evidence that conception of seed did not occur. In other words, the righteousness of unregenerate mankind cannot produce the fruit of righteousness, and that condition is common to all mankind who live life according to the flesh. The problem is the sin nature, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of Elohim. That's Romans 3.23. However, the antidote is provided to us when we receive the grace of Elohim through Messiah Yahusha, which is Messiah in us, the hope of glory. That's found in Colossians 1.27. We were created for acts of righteousness that come as a result 
of the grace empowerment within our spirit-soul connection, which is referred to in scripture as our hearts. From the beginning, or perhaps we should say before the beginning, we were never intended to reign in this life independent of the Most High. We were created for relationship with Yahuwah. The nature of that intimate spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship was to be, and yet still is, one that reflects our submitting our will to the will of the Sovereign of the Universe. So, this grace empowerment, which comes by faith, is the gift from the Most High Yah that supplies shalom, peace, wholeness, completion, nothing missing and nothing broken, unbroken fellowship with the living word of Yah. This grace and peace comes when we bow in true submission to the Most High and then proceed to grow in grace and true knowledge of Messiah as we renew our minds as instructed in Romans 12 verses 1 and 2 so that we may walk out that good, acceptable, and perfect will of the Most High Yah. For as the Most High spoke to the prophet Jeremiah, or Jeremiah, uh, chapter 29, verse 11, I know the plans I have toward you, declares Yah, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. For we are His workmanship, created in Messiah Yahusha for good works, which all He prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. That's found in Ephesians 2.10. And so it is not by acts of righteousness done in our own power, but rather acts of righteousness that are produced because we have been made the righteousness of Elohim through Messiah Yahusha, that we may receive his great and precious promises, some of which will be made manifest here and now, and some which are part of our eternal inheritance. But this is only possible when we partake of the perfect sacrifice and perfect supply of saving grace poured out for us by our Messiah, which serves to re-establish the kingdom rule and reign first from the throne of our hearts before we can ever see the ultimate manifestation of the millennial reign and beyond. Romans 8, verses 3 and 4 For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, Elohim sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law, or Torah, might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 4 The voice of him that cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way of Yahuwah. Make straight in the desert a highway for our Elohim. 
every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. End of quote. Now, Luke chapter 3, verse 5 confirms that John the Immerser is the voice in the wilderness spoken of in the book of the prophet Isaiah. This makes reference to John's role as the one called to announce the arrival and proclaim the mission of the Messiah as the sinless Lamb of Yah who would take upon himself our sin and make the crooked, perverse places in our lives straight and humble the high places of pride and idolatry and fill the low places with the living word of Yah, the kingdom within. Indeed, I bid you grace and peace. Please continue with us to part 5 of Roman Cross or Hebrew Tav. This will be a, yet another segment on grace and peace.